circles about 15 plus years ago or so that had at his, as its title, Facing the Giants. I'm sure many of you have seen it, about a football team facing the Giants. Well, this sermon is not about that. Instead, it's about David and real giants. David and real giants. Or one of them, at least. The last of them is described as a man of, of stature, of great stature. That means he was very tall. So the last one was a giant for sure, but all of them are described as being sons of the giant, born to the giant, and so it is very likely that they were all large men. What is more, they were all Philistines. They were all connected even to that infamous Goliath, one of them at least, but they were all from Gath, where Goliath was from, and so there was this family community connection at least. David had killed Goliath long before, and these were comrades of Goliath. And so they were longtime enemies of David. Now, in the text, two of them come with names. One is called, the first one is called Ishbi Binob. The second one is named Saf. In 1 Chronicles 20, which is a parallel text to our passage, giving more or less the same report. One thing we learn there is that this fellow named Saf was also called Sippai. So Ishbi, Binob, Saf, or Sif, Sippai. And then Chronicles names also the third giant, and his name was Lahmi. So three giants with names. And then the last one, he has no name as such, but he has some unique features. We're told that he has six fingers on each hand, and six toes on each foot. So we might call him Mr. Twelve Fingers or Mr. Twelve Toes. And when you put all this together, you have to say it's, ra it's rather intimidating, isn't it? Four, four giants or sons of the giant and with ominous sounding names. You might even think you could make a case for gangster sounding names. Ishbi Binob, Saf or Sipai, Lami and Mr. Twelve Fingers. These aren't friendly characters. And in these verses, we're told about how David has to face them. Now, we don't know when that was. But at some point in his reign, maybe over a period of time, these characters arose and were threats to David and to Israel and had to be dealt with. In fact, notice in the text, we, we can read there in verse 15 that there was war. And then we read in verse 18, again a battle. And then in verse 19, again there was war. And verse 20, again there was war. So time after time after time, there's war. And that reminds us that the life of the people of God is often marked by, by conflict and struggle. And that to be a Christian believer is to be a Christian soldier engaged in constant battle. And just when you finish with one enemy, just when you come out of one fight, just when you face down one temptation, just when you repel one satanic assault, up comes another. And sometimes the one that comes up may be a very mighty foe. And sometimes it is one mighty foe after another. How often do we have to say, how often we too may feel like we are facing giants. If we think of all the enemies that come in the Christian life, including the devil, the devil. In the New Testament, he is described as a dragon. And the world with all of its power and mass arrayed against the church and the people of God. And don't forget our own weak and sinful flesh in so many ways our most dangerous enemy. And altogether, not to mention individually, these can seem like mighty giants. And the Christian church and the Christian people are called to resist these giants and to fight against them. And we can, and we must, and we must, and we can through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we ponder these verses this morning, we find them full of important instruction, including serious warning but also great gospel encouragement. 
And so the title for this sermon is Facing the Giants. Facing the Giants. And three, point, three points to, to consider. First of all, hard they fight. And secondly, down they come. And third, hope they give. So facing the giants, hard they fight, down they come, and hope they give. Hard they fight, first of all. Hard they fight. Because what do we read about them? Let's notice some details in the text. For instance, the first one, Ishbi Binob, his bronze spear weighed 300 shekels, which works out to about seven or eight pounds, maybe, maybe a couple more. So just for context, Goliath's spear was iron and weighed 600 shekels, just the spearhead. So it was twice as heavy as the spear of Ishbi Binob. And yet an 8-pound, 9-pound, 10-pound spear is no little weapon either. Ishbi Binob was no man to mess with. He was strong and his weaponry was serious. And what is more, we are told he was bearing a new sword. Now you may have noticed when we read the text that the word sword is in italics because it's not in the Hebrew text. Translators are guessing with that word sword. It may well have been a sword. Swords are certainly the weapon of choice, we might say. But the main point is that he had something new. The main point is that he was fresh from the weapons factory. And whether it was a helmet or a shield or a club or a sword, really the point is Ishbi Binab was armed and he was ready to go and he was ready to fight. Indeed, he was a serious and dangerous threat. And notice what else it says in the text, verse 16, end of it. It says, he thought he could kill David. He thought he could kill David. Now, why did he think that? It may well have had something to do with what we read at the end of verse 15. David grew faint. So in the battle, in the midst of the intensity of the fight, with all the noise and all the danger and all of it unrelenting, there came a point when David became weary, when he became very, very weary. Maybe he could no longer swing his sword. Maybe he began to stumble about. Who, who knows how that went exactly? But at some point, Ishbi Binob saw an opportunity. He noticed David was struggling, and Ishbi Binob thought, now's my chance. David, I am going to kill you. And so he zeroed in on David, this mighty hulk of a man, with his armor, his weapons, his new sword. Ishbi Binob came lumbering over towards David. And somehow or other, he prepared to destroy David. And what we learn here is how hard he fights against David. This man's not playing games. It's a fight to the death. His mission is to annihilate the king of Israel. So let's freeze that frame for a moment. He's about to do it. We'll come back to this moment a little later. We want to focus in this overall point on how hard these all fight because two more giants come into the scene. Different times, different battles, maybe different place. We read about somewhere named Gob, not sure where that was, but two more gi giants show up there, Saf or Sippai and Lami. And they come against David's men, against God's people, and they too mean to kill and destroy the Israelites. And they were strong and they were mighty. They were giants or sons of the giant. One of them was a brother to Goliath, remember, Lami. And verse 19 says that the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now that's how Goliath's spear was described. They had the same spears. Or maybe Lami took Goliath after Goliath was killed. But it was a super thick, super heavy, super dangerous spear. And again, it indicates how hard these men fought. How hard, how mean. And once more, freeze the frames, as it were, in the midst of the battle. We'll come back to the moment, but notice yet the last guy, Mr. Twelve Fingers, Mr. Twelve Toes. What do we read about him in verse 21? Verse 21 says, he defied Israel. He defied Israel. That should remind you of someone. Remember how Goliath did exactly this when he challenged the Israelites back in 1 Samuel 17. Let me quote you the words of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verse 10. I defy the armies of Israel. That's what he said. 
Later in that same chapter, 1 Samuel 17, as David is approaching Goliath, David warns him, you have defied the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, you have defied him. And now here is Mr. Twelve Fingers doing exactly the same thing, defying Israel. That means that these men, they engaged in ridicule, in blasphemy, in arrogant, pompous rebellion and challenge. Today, people express this kind of thing in very vulgar language and with very vulgar gestures. And the same sort of spirit was being manifested in our text and with David and towards David and Israel and the God of the Israelites. And the giant was doing it and we get insight into his heart, into the heart of the giants. We get insight here into the hatred, the anger, the enmity, the aim of these men to obliterate the people of God and the man of God. Yes, let's notice that, especially how the first giant went after David. And again, it was because David was weak. And we learn here that David, too, was a mere man and probably getting to be a little older and not in his prime anymore. And it's a reminder that we all fade eventually. No doubt older ones among us, you will agree. I'm sure it's a good reminder also to our young people, as strong as you are, and it's good to be strong if you can. It's good to increase your strength and especially to steward your strength. Use your strength for God and for his kingdom and glory. How good and right to do. But eventually you too will fade. And David was beginning to fade. And so he became very vulnerable at this point. His men realized they needed to protect him. And they refused to let him go out with them into the battlefield. And not just because he wasn't as strong as before, but because he was David, because he was King David, because they say he was the lamp of Israel. We read that in the text, the lamp of Israel. That means he was the symbolic head of the people. He was the man that bound them together as one. He was their king. He was their light and salvation, as it were. And if he goes down, if he is killed, if the giants destroy him, the lamp of Israel will go out. Now, that's not altogether true because no mere man is the Messiah. As we all know, it's the Lord who is the true lamp and the ever-burning lamp of his people, and the Lord will preserve his people no matter what. But having said that, the Lord also works through means. He works through parents. He works through teachers. He works through principals. He works through mentors. He works through office bearers. We well understand that, don't we? And when leaders die and when they die early, from our perspective, that, that affects us. That impacts us. Sometimes that devastates us. And so that's what these men are expressing. David is not the Messiah, but he is the anointed of the Lord. And so they will guard him very carefully. Also because these giants want to kill him, and through killing him, David's men understand these giants want to extinguish the entire people of God. And, and thinking about that, let's realize the hatred and wrath of the devil himself behind these giants, animating these giants. They're coming and they're fighting so hard and so repeatedly and so defiantly. Here in that, the spirit of Satan. Here in that, the roar of the devil. He goes about as a roaring lion. He's been doing that for a long time. And his roar is evident in the way ungodly, wicked people rise up to destroy the people of God. And hard they fight. So this was no easy time for David and his men, just as it is no easy time for God's people, any of God's people, whenever enemies may threaten us. Not that we today wrestle with flesh and blood. Paul makes that clear. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities, though. We still wrestle, he says. Don't misunderstand the nature of the Christian life. That's why the New Testament says, fight the good fight of faith. That's why the New Testament says, be strong in the Lord. We need to understand there is a war, and we need to stand in this war. We don't live in a neutral world. We know that. We can't afford to take a spiritual vacation, 
Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's a hard go to be a Christian. It's hard life just generally in this world that's broken and corrupt. And, but to be a Christian in this world where we have enemies, and they are strong, and they are many, and they will be satisfied with nothing less than our destruction. So this text confronts us with reality. Hard they fight. Hard these giants fight. But let's be encouraged because not only does the text tell us about these giants and facing them and how hard they fight, but secondly, down they come. Down they come. Starting in verse 17. When Ishbi Binob is about to kill David, verse 17, but Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. We'd love for more details. We're not given them. But that marked the end of Ishbi Binob with his new sword and his great anger and his intent to kill David. And he's about to succeed when suddenly he's cut down. And then verse 18, Saf or Sippai, as Chronicles calls him, he threatens the Israelites. And Sibachai, the Hushethite, kills him. And so Saf goes down, or Sippai is destroyed. And then verse 19, the brother of Goliath, Lami with his super thick spear, he too is overcome. And so is Mr. Twelve Fingers, though he defies Israel, he too is killed and he dies. And so Samuel is presenting us with the fact that these giants, yes, hard they fight, but down they come, one after another, like giant redwoods in the forest. At the hand of a few hatchet men, one after another, they come down. And they all come down. And it helps to highlight the futility of their cause and their effort. So, so much so that we might even say that while hard they fight, that's true. At the same time, dumb they fight. Dumb they fight. Because first Goliath went down back in 1 Samuel 17. David took him out with a stone from a slingshot. You'd think that'd give them pause. But Ishbi Binob rises up and he thinks he can take care of David. No, nope, he goes down. Saf goes down. Might Lami get the point? And Mr. Twelve Fingers? No, they too rise up. We'll take care of it. And they go down. How blind sinful man is. How foolish he cannot win. And that's still true. And that's something to think about in this world and for the people of this world, and we'll come back to that in a few moments. But let's also realize that for ourselves, if we ourselves are at all resisting the Lord and fighting his way and refusing to bow to his word and spirit and to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, not willing to believe in him or to do what he says, all that he says, if that's you, what are you thinking? Do you really think you will be able to win against the Lord? Can anyone seriously believe that they can be stronger than he? That this text and the end of these giants, all four of them, all four, help to confirm to us all it is so utterly foolish to resist the Lord, to refuse to bow to his son. You will not kill him. You will not be able to beat him. In the ultimate context of, of you versus him, there's no doubt about the outcome. Every time that has been the matchup, he has won with everyone, and it will be no different with you. He wins. That is what the text makes clear. The giants come down, and as much as they represent the spirit of every sinner towards the Lord, as much as they represent that, the message is, message is unmistakable. God wins. Is even no contest, really. And if you still need to wake up to that reality, now's the time. Today's the day. But something else to learn about how all four giants come down. Who takes them down? Who kills them? It's not David. In fact, David himself is almost killed. One of his men has to come to his rescue. And then three more men are mentioned as well. And so it is not David that delivers Israel. Of course, ultimately, it's the Lord who delivers Israel. And David knew that, and, and he taught his men that. 
Back in 2 Samuel 5, for example, when David was fighting with the Philistines, and maybe some of these giant battles happened in that chapter, in that period of time. But in that context, context, it's very clear that the Lord delivered Israel. The Lord delivered David, and it's clear that David knows that. He says in 2 Samuel 5, verse 20, The Lord has broken through my enemies. And in the next chapter, 2 Samuel 22, which is also Psalm 18, which was read before the service, David sang a song to the Lord on the day when the Lord had delivered him from all his enemies. And so that's the starting point, the Lord. The Lord, always the Lord. But the Lord also works through means. And so when Goliath was threatening Israel long before, the Lord raised up David. The Lord called David. The Lord enabled David. But now in our text, it's no longer David. It's David's men. And four of them are involved. And what is more, how interesting that four are named, including their fathers or their family names or where they're from. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah. Sibekai, the Hushethite. Alhanan, the son of Jaroragim, the Bethlehemite. Jonathan, the son of Shimea. These were the giant slayers of the day. And we learn their names. And their names matter in the history of the people of God. And do we not learn from this that we all have work to do? All of us. The kingdom of God is no one-man show. No one individual has all the gifts needed to sustain and strengthen the people of God, the church of God, the kingdom of God. It's never a one-man show. And so every believer has something to contribute, whether big or small. And whatever it is, whatever it is you can contribute, be sure to do it. Some people serve. Some people give. Some people lead. Some people pray. All people need to pray. Some people teach. Some people encourage. That's why we need each other. We need each other for accountability. We need each other for encouragement, for safety and security. We need each other to be strong and steadfast and to hold, the, hold our ground and to grow in grace and in holiness. Do we realize how much we need each other? What would have happened to David if Abishai hadn't been there? David couldn't do it by himself. David wouldn't have survived by himself. Neither can you, neither can I make it alone. So what might the Lord be calling you to do? How might the Lord be calling you to serve? What might the Lord be calling you to contribute to the well-being of the congregation and to the advance of the kingdom of God. Listen, for the sake of one another and for the sake of all of us, you need to step up and do it, whatever it is. We also learn here that it's not wrong to highlight the role of particular people. Sometimes we may be hesitant to do that, to highlight the role of individuals. After all, it's God's church, it's Christ's kingdom, and to him belongs all the glory, and that is true. But the history of the church already in the Bible times is full of names of faithful men and women of God who are honored for their work and for their contribution. And we should not be afraid to mention those whom God has used in the life of his people or in our own personal lives. Just to give you one New Testament example of that, think of Paul in Romans 16 when he says in verse 3 and 4, and listen carefully and think about the language in relationship to our text. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, says Paul, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So God alone gets all the glory. Let's be clear about that. But it is not wrong. In fact, it is very right to recognize the faithful people of God he has used to build his church and to bless our lives, including to protect us from danger, to warn us, to save us, to direct us. And now I'm thinking of parents and teachers and friends and fellow believers, and fellow laborers. 
Thank you for speaking to me, we might say. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for looking out for me. Thank you for caring for me enough to call me out. That's good to do. How many more giants will come down as God's people work together? Facing the giants, hard they fight, down they come. And lastly, yet notice, hope they give. Hope they give. Now, you might think that's rather strange. How can giants give believers any hope? But let's remember that by the end of the text, all the giants are dead. And what is more, this is the last we read of giants threatening the people of God. I didn't realize this until I studied this. After this chapter and the parallel in Chronicles, over in Amos, we get one more note about giants, but it's about a time before our text. So after this text and these four giants coming down, so far as we know, that's it. No more literal giants threatening the people of God. And so the point is, these giants, dead, defeated, destroyed, dead, what hope they give to the people of God. Because the hope is that someday every enemy will be destroyed. Someday every enemy that ever threatens and endangers the lives of those who belong to the people of God will be put down forever. That's the hope. And let me remind you of something else the Lord said earlier about David to strengthen this hope. Back in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 3, verse 18. There in the words of Abner, who is trying to persuade all of Israel to pledge allegiance to David... Abner said this, The Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of their enemies. In other words, Abner was reminding the people of God of the promise of God through his anointed, first Saul, if he had obeyed, but now David, the Lord's choice. Through David, the Lord was saying, I will give you victory over these Philistines. How often the Philistines had been a pest and a pain and worse. And the Lord raised up David to say, listen, victory is coming through this man. And now here with 2 Samuel 21 and the killing of four giants recorded for us, what's happening is that we are learning the Lord is making good on his promise. He didn't just say he would would do it. He did it. He did it. And so we ought to note that. And it's meant to fill us with hope. Because it's saying to us, the Lord will do everything he has promised. And someday he will deliver his people from every enemy. All the power of the devil. All the pressure of the world. Every remnant of sin and evil. Every last manifestation of the giants of danger and defiance. He will deliver us. That is what he has promised. And do you remember how he has certified that promise? Since our text, he has certified that promise through no less than the sending of his own beloved son, the greater than David, the ultimate anointed of the Lord. And when you think of him, Jesus Christ, do you remember how he too, in the midst of the conflict, became faint? David grew faint. Jesus grew faint. When he came to us in the likeness of sinful flesh and he was subject to all the weakness and frailty that we experienced, including there in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he staggered at the prospect of the cup that he was going to have to drink, and he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And the enemy was coming in like a flood. And while David had friends to stand by him and rescue him, Jesus could have no friends. Oh, Peter tried. He, he whipped out his sword. He, he swung it around wildly and recklessly and ultimately unsuccessfully. What is more, Jesus wouldn't have it. Peter, put away your sword. If I need defense, I can call legions of angels. And they can smash and destroy any enemy. But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, he surrendered to the way of the cross. He allowed himself to be bound, led away, tried, convicted, sentenced, crucified. And doing so entirely alone. 
In fact, that's how it had to be because Jesus was here by the appointment of God the Father on account of the covenant between Father and Son and Spirit before the foundation of the world. That Jesus here would give himself as a substitute for his people. Sinners as we are, he would suffer in their place. And so the giants of sin and Satan were allowed to come round Jesus. Among other things that was happening at the cross, that was happening. The giants of sin and Satan were allowed to come and, and to do their level best to defy him and destroy him. And in some sense, they were allowed to succeed, at least for a time. Although, although even when Jesus died, he was still in control. And he died in victory. It must have made the devil so uneasy to hear Jesus say, it is finished. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. It must have made the devil so frustrated. That's not how it's supposed to be. Nevertheless, Jesus was dead. His body was laid in a tomb. A stone, a mighty stone was set before the mouth of the tomb. And that seemed to be it. The great David was dead. Except that on the third day, he rose from the dead. And therein he proved that he was the victor over sin, over Satan, over death, over hell. He was the great giant slayer. He was the one who stood upright while all the giants who had come around him were slain were leveled. And now we know through his great saving work, both his crucifixion and his resurrection, now we know it's proclaimed to us in the Bible, there is pardon for sin and for sinners like you and me. Even for all who turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is pardon for sin and the promise of life, even for all who turn and how we need to turn. How we need to turn because the same enmity in these giants lives also in you and me, left to ourselves. Fools these giants were. And we are also fools by nature as sinners. We talked earlier about resistance to God. Do you know about the enmity of your own heart towards God by nature? Do you know about that enmity? When you hear the commandments of God, do you understand when there's something in you that says, I don't want to obey when you hear about the call of Jesus Christ, come to me and follow me, do you understand about something in you that is not always so eager, so willing? What is that something? It is the same thing that animated these giants. It is sinful, satanic resistance to the God of our life. And that has to be overcome by the power and spirit of Christ. And we need to be conscripted into his service. We need to be made willing in the day of his power. That is why the word of God says, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. And when we kiss him, when we surrender to him, when we lay down our weaponry and we say, we will be your servants by your grace. Do you understand that it is then that this passage that's before us gives us so much hope? Because as we stare at the dead bodies of these giants, these awful enemies of God, and now also our enemies, but they are dead. And that points to God's faithfulness to his covenant promises to save his church. And so these giants give us hope. Also when we look further down the corridors of time and we see the cross and now it's empty and the tomb and now it's empty. And all the more we may be confirmed, all who believe we serve a God of hope. It's true he wins. He won. He's winning. He'll win. And he enables us, therefore, to abound in hope, even in a world that is so hopeless. And so as the battles go on, because they do, because remember, David had to face battle after battle, and so do we. And now not literal giants, but spiritually we still face gigantic foes. What are the foes that you face in your life? What are the giants, as it were, that you have to confront every day? Giants of sin and temptation. 
Giants of discouragement and distraction. Giants of false teaching and enmity and hatred and pressure and persecution. Giants of suffering, giants of weakness. Giants of anxiety and fear. What about giants of enslaving, enslaving temptations, soul-destroying temptations, meeting us at every turn, beckoning us, sometimes seeming to exert so much power over our spirits. We understand what it means to face giants. But let us look to the Lord and let us lean on his word and let us believe his promises. And whatever beatings and bruisings we may suffer and even, even whatever may happen to our body, think of, think of the words of Isaiah 54 and claim these in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I wonder if Isaiah was thinking back of 2 Samuel 21 when he said that. If he was remembering the fields of battle as, as the stories were passed down to the generations and those giants and all that weaponry and how they were defeated and destroyed. And now Isaiah says through the power of the Spirit of God to the people of God as they trust in God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Do you understand, Isaiah says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. And so whatever happens, whatever happens, God will bring his people safely through and someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And God's people will be finally, fully, and forever delivered. And, and Jesus, as the great lamp of his people, will forever shine. They, they couldn't snuff him out. They couldn't quench his lamp. He will be the light of the new Jerusalem. He will burn and shine to all eternity, and his people will live in the glory of that light. We live even today as a people who have every reason to be full of hope. One of the commentators said this, let the Lord encourage you by way of these dead giants. Let the Lord encourage you. Giants never lie, at least not the dead ones. They give hope. God will be true to his word. He will fulfill every promise. Every enemy of his people will be put down. And so we may live full of hope as we trust in the Lord. I read recently about an old man, a believer, who was also in his life a pastor. And when he was 82, he wrote to one of his former church members and he said this, what I preached to you so long ago is now the one stay and strength of my life. He had preached hope in the Lord, and now he was living it. It's what helped him to go into the evening years of his life and to the end. Hope. And so it may be for us, congregation, young or old, as we trust in the Lord, we may hope in the Lord. We may be sure. And so remember this scene. Remember the fields of battle. Remember the giants. See them as it were, lifeless on the ground. They don't live. They're dead. And be encouraged and be full of hope in the Lord. Amen. Let us sing together.